we are being joined by the fabulous Dr. Diana Reeder, who will be sharing with us an incredibly well-researched, exciting uh, research plan and uh, um, growing literary criticism, which is uncovering uh, re hitherto repressed literary stories from some of our best Indigenous First Nations writers across Canada. So I cannot tell you how inventive is this woman and how difficult it is to have an acknowledgement and a welcoming uh, which is appropriately uh, respectful of our traditional territories, uh, unceded territories on which we are here. And I know each of our host nations, I know the Coquitlam, I know the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Coast Salish would all agree that while these territories are unceded, that what happens on the territories of a public university like Simon Fraser is, I think, an important testament to learning, to sharing, to the kind of collaborative futures that can be built here. These are tough times for this university, and I know it's personally very, very uh, difficult. Deanna has been a warrior in favor, as many have been across the university, of opposition uh, to the closure of the Aboriginal uh, University Transition Program, which has been a painful moment uh, in this history. I know, too, she's been a strong supporter, as many of her colleagues have been in the First Nations Department, of the um, extraordinary year of reflection and coming together in dialogue over the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council. And I, for one, have not been able to participate as fully as I might like. But what I can say is that every opportunity I've had to participate in that has been remarkable, has been absolutely personally um, uh, involving, destabilizing, but also extraordinarily constructive. The report, which will be forthcoming in the middle of June, will be setting out for many of us, I think, a journey where we will be reflecting upon our teaching practice, but in particular, identifying those new areas of research which we think are so important. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so proud to introduce Deanna Reeder to you this afternoon. She's already well known, and I can see many of her colleagues and friends in the audience, and I'm very glad about that, but also people new uh, to Indigenous literary history, and that is also exciting. Uh, Deanna is Cree Métis. She is, as you know, a professor in the Department of First Nations Studies and in English, a joint appointment, and teaches a wide range of courses. Um, in popular fiction, perspectives on gender and sexuality. She is an associate member of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies, an invaluable advisor in that regard. And, uh, and uh, director of something I don't know, but it's very important. It's a master's program for teachers in English, M-A-T-E, mates, good mates, all of them, uh, based at Surrey. She has been um, a principal investigator with co-applicants Dr. Marjorie Fee and Cherry, uh, Cherokee scholar Dr. Daniel Heath Justice at UBC on a five-year SHRC grant uh, called The People and the Text, Indigenous Writing in Northern North America up to 1992. From 2015 to 2012, it will be ongoing. Sorry, 2015 to 2020. She has recently co-edited an anthology of literary criticism with Dr. Linda Mora um, called Learn, Teach, and Challenge. This is very much part of Deanna's personality. Approaching Indigenous Literatures, which has been published by Wilfrid Laurier Press in 2016. And she is also collaborating with Dr. Sophie McCall, Dr. David Gartner, and Gabrielle Hill on an anthology suitable for first-year university classrooms entitled Read, Listen, and Tell, Indigenous Stories from Turtle Island. I'm very happy to also identify that she and Sophie McCall stepped forward as part of the um, call responses to the call for proposals for innovative courses to mark Canada's 150th that the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences advertised um, a long year ago now. She is team teaching with Dr. McCall a um, uh, course at the 200 level this summer for a, a very, very blessed group of students, I think, inviting in over 12 or 15 of these authors to address the students over the course of the semester 
and to prepare um, an audio and video uh, record of this, which will be part of the um, uh, anthology about to be uh, published. So I'm very delighted to introduce her to you today. Now there is an interesting format to these things. The first part of it is the presentation from Dr. Reeder herself. Uh, the second part of it is the very important question and answer session. And we actually had not one, which is the normal sponsorship in events of this sort, but three students. And I wanted to introduce the students who volunteered to take care of <laughs> the questioning and answering so Deanna is prepared for them. So, <laughs> Trina Chambers, are you here? <laughs> <laughs> Trina, welcome and obviously well known, I can tell from the chuckle. Um, Deborah Smith. Are you here? Thank you very much, Deborah. And Sandy Delis, am I pronouncing that right? Dillis. Sandy, of course, Dillis. Dil okay, thank you very much for coming. And they will be sort of helping animate the question and answer at the end. So approximately 20, 25 minutes presentation, approximately 20, 25 minutes discussion. The discussion does not stop hard at 12.30. Instead, what we do is welcome pizza and prose and polemic uh, for about uh, another 20 or 25 minutes. So until 1 o'clock, we have this room thereabouts. Thank you all for coming, and let me introduce Dr. Reeder. Deanna, thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> really appreciate all of you coming. I uh, want to just begin just by following local protocols to identify that um, my name is Deanna Rader, and that my, while well, my family currently lives all over the prairies, my Cree Métis family is from uh, northern Saskatchewan, uh, from La Ronge, and historically from G Green Lake. Um, and while I have lived and worked on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Stalwo peoples, I, I um, recognize myself as a guest. I also want to dedicate today's um, lecture uh, in the, um, by partly amending the description of the talk by um, saying that the teaching of Indigenous students continues to require risky moves out of institutional and hierarchical ways of knowing. This talk is dedicated to the Indigenous students who continue to challenge what an incoming university student ought to look like, as well as challenge the definition of academic success. Rather than simply a project that includes Indigenous people in the university, where Indigenous students are recruited, admitted, and taught as though the university has no obligation to them or no historical injustices to address, instead new ways of teaching, reaching out, and thinking about education and reconciliation need to replace standard approaches. And just a shout out to um, some of the many of you here who have been um, doing that work to protest the closing of the AUTP program and uh, AUTP, including uh, Dr. Vanderway, Dr. Hathaway, Dr. Chenier. Your support is very support, um, uh, appreciated. Now, the subtitle of this paper, Recuperating Canadian Indigenous Stories, is the main goal of the research project that I lead, the one that Catherine referred to. Um, we currently, we are compiling an open access annotated bibliography of as much Indigenous writing in Northern North America, in other words, in Canada before Confederation and after, up until 1992, that we can find. We're writing a literary history to accompany this list. We're working on a handbook to help literary scholars navigate Indigenous protocols while engaging with communities around their cultural property. And we're exploring the digital humanities tools to preserve and study these texts. Essentially, we're trying to bring attention to stories that have been untold, or more often, stories that have been told but not heard. In the context of Canada's 150th birthday, I celebrate not the history of the nation, but instead the vitality of the literary output that typically has been neglected. But this project is working to help celebrate. 
Yet I'm struck by how many of the indigenous writers whose work we are recuperating had clearly articulated through literature the injustices perpetrated by the Canadian state against indigenous peoples, and yet their critiques were not legible to dominant society. Their stories were told but not heard. And that means that the work that I and my colleagues, and this includes a team of extremely talented research assistants, are not simply working on a recovery mission. And this is the original research team circa 2016. Um, it was brought to my attention that it's very female-centric, but what I really want to point out that might not be obvious to you, I celebrate that, female-centric, <laughs> um, is that actually of these seven researchers, five are indigenous. You know, a ratio uh, you know, five Indigenous scholars for every, for every two settler scholars is such a beneficial, generative, um, uh, worth em emphasizing ratio. So. so to recuperate Indigenous stories, to be really able to hear these stories, we have to eliminate the barriers around the reading and understanding of them. It's not simply a matter of reminding people, listening, oh, finding the book and putting it on the table, go read this. Instead, what is needed is an effort to reframe what readers understand Indigenous expression to be and to look to Indigenous epistemologies for guides to this understanding. And there are several moves we need to make even before we begin. First, we need to find a word that will prevent us from seeing the oral and the literary as opposites. In fact, we need a word that encompasses both. And this has been talked about by many colleagues preceding me, um, in, you know, including Chris Chuton and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for the purposes of today, let's just, I'll use the word story or narrative. Please don't um, assume I'm speaking, uh, when I say the word literature, for it to only mean um, one of this uh, double side binary, but let's instead try to think of the oral and the written as both forms of indigenous, as the same, as, in, as the same. Okay. The second move we need to make is to replace the notion that literacy is a complex technology belonging to so-called advanced civilizations so that settler Canada can continue to ignore or underestimate indigenous authors. So this is a picture of the first Indigenous person to write a book in Canada, Anishinaabe writer George Copway, whose autobiography was published in 1847. This third move is to see that all varieties of narrative are equally valid, so that we can see that all these varieties of narrative are equally Indigenous. The reason why I say that is often work like Kapwe and the Anishinaabe literary coterie of the 19th century were really dismissed as corrupted, you know, colonized, Christianized narratives, but not as examples of Indigenous intellectual production. And a shout out to Robert Warrior for bringing this, uh, this um, idea first to discussion. Um, to do so, to, d to uh, dismiss work that doesn't seem appropriately Indigenous is a part of a larger strategy to avoid categorizing any narrative that is not what we expect, is not really Indigenous. And finally, we need to believe Indigenous <laughs> writers. That is, we need to accord Indigenous authors and their narratives the same credibility as we accord non-Indigenous writers and writing. So there are two examples I'd like to um, talk to you about today. This is really uh, an ambitious, uh, um, project that there are a lot more um, examples, but I'm going to give you two that my, that my team are, and I are working on. This is Edward Ahenikiu, and probably one of the most exciting things um, that we have discovered is in the archives of the Saskatchewan, um, Saskatchewan Provincial Archives, we found a novel written by him circa 1918. This is actually an image of the scribbler found in the archives and his handwriting. And currently his great niece, um, Heather Hodgson and Cree historian Dr. Winona Wheeler are working to release it. My team, however, has transcribed it from the written and to the, uh, um, uh, to the um, doc files that I'll show you. I want to talk a little bit about the sixth chapter 
called the council meeting that describes men of the reserve coming together to complain about the injustices of the Indian agents, or he refers to them in the narrative as, as commissioners, who refuse to give them permits to sell their cattle or their hay. While it's clear that young Black Hawk, the hero of the story, uh, most of the book is dedicated to the young Black Hawk, um, well, it's clear that the young Black Hawk, the title character is literate and indeed bookish. The men in this conversation are from a previous generation and haven't learned how to read or write in English, while they might speak it a little. Um, and so I'll begin with a character named Brass Buffalo. So this is, we're, we're coming into a big, long conversation at, at the council meeting, and Brass Buffalo is about to interject. He was a fiery man. He was an old man. I was at the first treaty and heard every single word that was put into the ears of the people. With honeyed and conciliatory speech, the representatives of the Queen spoke. They placed the Book of God on the table to show they were speaking truth. They pointed to that sun. It's there yet. They pointed to the Saskatchewan River. It flows yet. The treaty was to stand as long as those existed. Their speech was good and their hearts were friendly and we accepted what they had to say. We accepted the spirit of their promises. Our lands were to be reserved. That's the word they used, reserved. It was to be ours still, as it had been ours from the ages past. Did they tell us that we were to be like herded swine tied down hand and foot with our reserves as pastors? Did they say then that we would have to shed our manhood and be forever treated like little children and be at the mercy of any stray fancy that happens to come into the minds of some one man who bears the name of commissioner and who under the idea of policy issues decrees that must be applied on all fours to all reserves and all Indians in them without taking into consideration the difference of conditions? And as he carries on, he concludes, let us write, they're talking about writing a letter of complaint um, um, to the um, Department of Indian Affairs, but heaven knows there may not be much attained by such procedure. So in this case, Henneke reveals in Brass Buffalo's short speech a character who, while unable to read and write in English, is well able to discuss, remember, and analyze the treaty process. In fact, he is very concerned with the role of words and with writing. Um, from you know, the honeyed speech of the Queen's representatives to the Book of God, and the, invoking also the treaty language, you know, the sun and the river, you know, uh, the language that was encoded in treaties. You know, these words will be true for as long as the sun shines, as long as the water flows, you know, the river flows. All to emphasize the solemnity of the contract and to contrast this with the Crown's interpretation of the word reserve. Brass Buffalo insists that the land is, quote, ours still as it had been from ages past, unquote, even as any white person, doesn't say white, given the name of commissioner can issue decrees with no regard to the effects upon Indian people and his situation in particular. So the chief and councillors decide to list their complaints in a letter to the superintendent of Indian Affairs in Ottawa and seek out the reserve clergyman to pen the letter for them. And it's in this case, um, they, they go over to the kindly faced minister. He welcomed them in and asked them to sit down. It was plain that he was a good and earnest man, but it was plain also that he was of the conciliatory time. And basically, the minister says, I, I really can't get involved. You know, th this isn't, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here to preach the gospel. And um, then, said the chief, ignoring the last part. Is it not the teaching of Christ that God is just and loves justice? Is it not the duty of those who are able to do what they can to right wrong? Yes, it is, says the minister, but it is not for me. Your savior suffered injustice for your sake. Can ye not be like him? So here he's really grappling with the major uh, you know, um, rhetoric of the time. He continues, basically, the, the chief says, you know, can you not just write this letter for us and not appear in it? Can you just do the writing part, you know? You don't have to. <laughs> After all, you will only be the medium of communication. And 
The minister responds, I will tell you, chief, I got into their bad books because I wrote for Indians once before. I am a humble servant of God and would not dabble in worldly things. They will say I am interfering in their work and they will produce reports and things to disprove what I say and I will be blamed. So rather than juxtapose the chief and counselors as illiterate and the cleric as literate, Ahenikyu is instead portraying the Indians as assertive and courageous, while the clergyman is passive and weak. The chief is seeking, quote, a medium of communication, unquote. The clergyman is trying to stay out of the government's bad books. The issue is resolved when a young American comes into the mission and upon hearing the problem, he offers to write the letter if the, if the priest would translate. And so essentially um, the, the narrative notes that the, the letter assumed a respectful tone, asking the department to apply the various aspects of its policy regarding the permit system in a more discriminative way. So there's this um, sort of recording of a, a sense of, uh, of um, a, a application or supplication to, the, uh, to Indian Affairs. In the end, the letter was signed by the chief and counselors. It was then registered and posted. The next day, it went off on its way to Ottawa, the only way that the Indian voice had a chance of being heard, says the narrator." Unquote. Now, whether Ahenikyu actually had confidence in the written supplications to the superintendent of Indian Affairs, 1918 after all was the heyday of Duncan Campbell Scott, the characters he creates proclaim um, um, oh, that the characters he, cre creates, uh, he creates proclaim. It is clear that his characters believe in writing, that written communication has a status and a power um, in this context that oral communication does not, and that their oral, um, that their letter of complaint is the only way the Indian voice had a chance of being heard by the powers that be. Again, like the conversation with the clergyman, their ability um, their lack of ability to read and write in English is not what made them powerless. It is the fact that they are, in the words of Brass Buffalo, quote, like herded swine tied down hand and foot with our, from our, with our reserves as pastures. Okay. Now I just want to poke at a couple of assumptions just to encourage you to think outside of how um, this context is commonly represented. In fact, you know, um, this is a, 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 an image of the beginning of chapter two where you see the father, Black Hawk's father, in the Indian home and he is reading. He's not reading and writing in English, he's reading and writing in, in syllabics. Um, I encourage you not to assume that the chief and counselors are illiterate because it is already established in this chapter that they, uh, that um, least Black Hawk's father reads in Cree syllabics, that it's highly possible that all of the men at that council table um, are illiterate, just not in English. And I caution that you not to assume that this knowledge of Cree syllabics is solely the result of contact. Just think to yourself, what is it that you might know about um, Cree syllabics? I'd like to direct you to the work of Dr. Winona Wheeler, Dan Stevenson, who in, 20, in uh, 2000 wrote an article called Calling Badger and the Symbols of the Spirit Language. And she argues that the origin of the Cree syllabary has been miscredited. While Wesleyan Methodist Reverend James Evans has been credited with its creation, she disputes this in, a, in this work. Quote, the great Canadian myth has endured for over 160 years virtually unchallenged. Few question col colonialist conqueror renditions of the past and even fewer bothered asking Cree people directly about the origins of their writing system. A handful of anthropologists are aware that an indigenous version exists in Cree oral histories, but most, like David Mendelbaum, choose to disregard it in favor of the James Evans story. Without spending too much more time, thinking about that, I think that from what I have shown you, it's clear, sufficient evidence to argue that Ahenikyu valued literacy, and even though his ambitions to become a published fiction writer were never realized, he was a master of narrative both in Cree and English, a learned Cree intellectual and Christian who was bilingual and literate in both Cree and English. 
Yet, readers should not be attribute his learnedness to assimilation. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm arguing points made by others um, before me. Readers shouldn't attribute um, the ability of a culture to adapt to new circumstances as a sign of resilience and strength. Haneke portrays his Cree characters as resilient and strong, even as the deck is stacked against them. And second, you have to think also about the traditions of petroglyphs in Cree territory, the writing on rocks, you know, a form of learnedness that precedes contact that would be well um, understood in, um, in his worldview. His, uh, our understanding of a Haneke as a man of letters is supported by his training as a Cree intellectual, not in spite of his um, understandings as a, Cree, uh, as a Cree intellectual. Now, I'm sure you're curious as to why this novel was not in publication. Haneke, after all, did have publications in his lifetime. His Christian writings, some in uh, Slavic and some in English, were published. His work in the Cree language to help or to inform linguists to understand Cree were published. His work in ethnography to write down, quote, Cree myths, unquote, Cree cultural stories that ethnographers um, want to, quote, collect and preserve, unquote, um, were all published. And there's a long correspondence with his friend Paul Wallace as he tried to get his fiction and also some other political um, work published, but he was never successful during his lifetime. And as a legacy of this, the family is hesitant to have his work published without their full control. Why did publishers and um, publishing partners seek Haneke's expertise as a Cree language expert, as a culture expert, as an Anglican clergyman? I can't say for certain why publishers ignored and underestimated Haneke's fiction. Why was his work appropriate when he was an informant to anthropologists and not as an author? Why was his work not sought out? Let's keep this in mind while we look at a second um, case study, and this is Vera Manuel. <coughs> Vera Manuel is the daughter of Tanaka cultural leader Marceline Paul and Setwakmuk leader George Manuel, who was the author of The Fourth World. You might know him about that. Her brother was Art Manuel, who recently passed away. During Manuel's life, she had only a few of her narratives published, one short story in 1993, and in, um, another uh, a play first performed in 1992 and later published in 1998 um, called The Strength of Indian Women. Pardon me, just Strength of Indian Women. This is a, a, a news clipping from that period of time. Currently, I'm working together with Algonquin scholar Michelle Kupal, Métis poet Joanne Arnott, and Vera's sister, educator Emmeline Manuel, to assemble Vera's collected works. Now, much of the impetus of this collection is the combination of efforts inspired by Manuel. She was an active uh, drama therapist and healer in the Lower Mainland, but also very well known in Indigenous communities. So while she might not be a name easily recognizable in the literary scene, in Indigenous communities, she was recognized as a writer, as a healer, and as a, as a leader. Okay. So it... Um, it was really the, the inspiration of the um, strength of Indian women at such a wonderful book to teach that um, several of us who uh, wanted to see it back in publication. Oh dear. Oh, that's a problem. Did that happen to you too? Did, did it just disappear on you? No. Okay, great. I guess I'll just keep jiggling. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So, um, it, it happened that um, when Michelle Capel and I started thinking about republishing her plays, um, we then came into contact with Métis poet uh, Joanna Knott, who in the uh, last years of Vera Manuel's life, uh, they had decided to put together uh, her poetry. And so we, we bound um, together in efforts, and um, just last year actually in Calgary, and we contacted Emmeline Manuel, who um, Michelle had been in contact with previously. Lo and behold, she had an archive. She had an archive of, uh, of Vera's work all in her desk in outside Cranbrook. So that we've currently actually just put this publication into the um, First People's First Press. Um, is it changed for you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I, don't know, I don't, really don't know why it's doing that. Can you hit? Okay. Um, anyway, let me... Uh, 
So we decided to um, put this work together. Um, in fact, Joanne last in 2016 <laughs> Uh, visited Emmeline in her home near Cranbrook and collected the files from Vera's old computer and took photos of any materials that seemed relevant and our team worked to process that. Much of Manuel's work as an artist is founded on an intimate knowledge of the suffering brought on by colonial institutions. However, the success of her art and her healing vision is more than simply as a witness to trauma. First, she was able to conduct therapeutic work with her mother and at least one sister that grounded her intergenerationally and allowed her the insight to see the damage done to her parents and community that was inflicted upon them and opening the door for her to accept and forgive the abuses she suffered. The, also, what's key to this is her, um, her role in the, um, in, in the her understanding of theater as a, part, as a part of healing. And so in an interview with uh, um, Peter Morin from Redwire, which is a now defunct um, activist magazine, um, she talks about this moment when a play that was based on her own personal traumas and experiences of family violence was performed with her very well-known father in the audience. She was very nervous, not uh, um, certainly expecting that whoever was organizing this didn't realize how close to the bone this was going to, um, going to, going to be. And so they asked me to bring this play, and they didn't really know what it was about, so I managed. They brought him, my father, out, and I went um, and put him in the first row. I, I was really nervous about that. And during the break, I went to go talk to my dad just to see what his reaction was. And he told me, my only regret was that your mother wasn't alive to see this. She'd be so proud of you. And I thought he really understood. Part of him really understood. The personal experience of, of being able to successfully share her story help, um, with her family and community helped her understand the opportunities for healing using art um, so that she was able to help further future creative partners articulate the unspeakable, that which terrorized them. So I just want to explain to you something important um, in a, her play, Strength of Indian Women, that is not often um, difficult to understand when it was published in 1992. What happened was there was an incident in this play where the um, women who had gone to residential school together had talked about, this is annoying, isn't it? <laughs> had talked about the, this mysterious white powder that was added to their, uh, the, the, that, um, that was added to the flour that, they, that, were, that was fed to them. They, it was a woman actually in the, in the play who said, you know, I met somebody who worked at the mill and he told me all about this. And the women right away speculated, that must be why we were so sick. And of course, in 1992, difficult to understand what, what this might be, of course, unless you think of the word, uh, work of Ian Mosby, you know, who um, it, it was not until 2013 that historian Ian Mosby revealed findings that supported the suspicions of Manuel's characters. He reported the government approved researchers conducted nutrition experiments on selected residential school mates of the 1940s and 50s, and he identifies a specific example. Um, he writes in a 2014 blog, the confirmation of what has long been known by these survivors, that they were part of some kind of scientific experiment, had unleashed a flood of additional questions yet to be answered. It is in many ways a depressing commentary on contemporary Canadian society that such stories were not taken seriously by the government or the media until they were published in an academic journal by a white male settler historian. Yet over the two decades earlier than Mosby, Manuel took these stories seriously. And she quotes a, a, um, her own mother, but she says, I didn't make these stories up, uh, these stories told in the strength of Indian women. They came from pictures my mother painted for me with her words, words that helped me see her as a little girl for the first time. In the anthology that we're bringing out, the in, um, in honor of the strength of Indian women, the plays, uh, uh, plays, stories, and poems of Vera Manuel. We're including three stories that have never been published, stories that were found in, you know, in that um, 
office of Emmeline Manuel. It even has the you know, September date, 1987. If this worked, you would see it yourself. Um, of a story that's been typed up called The Gray Building. About a daughter driving her mother past the residential school um, that the mother had attended and the mother remembering how her own grandmother had tried to save her. The next story, Teresa, is about a strong, powerful girl in residential school who openly defied the nuns who tried to undermine the girl's sense of worth only to be killed, and the story untold by a conspiracy of silence. And finally, a, a, a story called The Letter that's more contemporary with a heroine named, uh, named Vera trying to manage the racial logics that underpin her um, experience as one of the only Native kids going to a, a, a white school. In all of these stories, Manuel understands the function of state and church deception in the residential school's curriculum of shame, violence, and worthlessness. She also understood the ceremonial actions of witnessing that exist in Tanaka and Sekwakmuk ceremony that can be replicated in secular theatrical performances and the subsequent healing power of performance and respect. Conclusion. I'm reminded by a, of a quote um, by Edward Hanekew in 1925. It's something, um, let me just read it to you. He writes, the time has come in the life of my race that that which has been like a sealed book to the masses of our Canadian compatriots, namely the view that the Indians have of certain matters affecting their lives should be known. And of course the tragedy of this is even though he wrote it in 1925, it did not receive come to publication until 1973, effectively changing sort of political critique into historical document. Right? It's no longer read in the same way. He, he wrote it, was willing to publish it, but no press was ready to publish him. No publisher was ready to hear what he had to say. And when his words were finally published, they were, cha uh, they were changed. Likewise, Manuel had great aspirations to be a novelist and a writer, but couldn't find opportunities. There are multiple complex reasons why Hanekew and Manuel and a series of other narratives have not been heard. Often these narratives were composed, sent to publishers only to be rejected, or sitting among personal papers forgotten. Part of this is because there wasn't a wider reading public that wanted to hear our stories. There wasn't a larger infrastructure like public school curriculum that created a demand for our work. There wasn't the social power to access the appropriate venues to get the story out or the social status to add legitimacy to our words to make them credible, to make them believable. And there wasn't the epistemology or the recognition of epistemologies, worldviews, to understand what was being told. Thank you. recuperating and rediscovering these practices. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Deanna. Really, really interesting. And apologies for the, I, know. I don't know what internet or whatever um, uh, stopping out there. Um, what I would like to do is inv invite our three wise sisters, Trina, Deborah, and Sandy, up here. Oh. Please. Oh, please. And yeah. I'm going to share the, I'm going to share the, the mic and actually uh, uh, switch around these chairs. Mm -hmm. okay. And who would like to go first? Why don't I start with Sandy? Sure. And then you can share the, the mic. This is very appropriate. So this is an opportunity for discovery, and then we're going to open up um, to the audience for a couple of questions and clarification. I had said to them, oh, you won't have to say it. <laughs> <laughs> You're fooled. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Okay, and then. It doesn't seem to broadcast there, but it broadcasts to the camera. Oh. And one of the things that I wanted to say is the silent camera over there is actually extremely important to us. We're producing a video from this, and then hopefully developing it in uh, uh, modules that teachers can use in the classroom throughout the lower mainland. So apologies for the this, and speak up. 
so you can be heard. <laughs> Um, well, I'd like to actually ask you a question yeah. specifically of, you said uh, what is being told um, is not being heard, if, you know, in that sense. And I think that that was, you know, 150 years ago, but it's still current today. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do, you, how do you feel like that could be articulated to people to understand how important and how relevant it is to move forward with that what was being unheard for so long is now to be told? I mean, I, I think we, we started off by dedicating this to the uh, students who um, won't have the, the opportunity this year to be part of a transition program. And this was a program that if you asked Indigenous educators who were involved in the program, if you ask students who were in the program, they would have talked about its multiple successes. And I think it's just got to do with about power, you know, and, and who has access to power and, and, and who makes, to make decisions. And so, I, I mean, I think it's, I certainly remember a day being at university where I had no professor that was Indigenous. I didn't, such a thing as an Indigenous student center didn't exist. And I didn't expect to read anything by an Indigenous person because I was studying important things, right? And that process of me unlearning and decolonizing is, is as important to me as any of my classmates at the time and as any of my students today. You know, so I think there, there, that we have to, um, keep fighting to have those voices heard, but it is amazing to me. I really thought, just let me be a professor. <laughs> and then these things will change. But it's not just a matter of, 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 of saying the words. The words have been said. We have to change how people listen. And that, you know, I'm, I have some ideas about, but you know. <laughs> I have one more thing too. Uh, you had said to at one uh, one day Deanna came to uh, the RA and said, "Can you guys please look at what it says on rate my professor about me?" Oh, stop! No, no, <laughs> don't tell the story. No, no, no. But one of the things that came up that was pretty interesting was that people were were they were all happy with her. That's that's it. But what she was that articulating was that. You know, some of the people were saying that, well, you know, I thought this was an English class and, and so there's too much indigenous content in it. And it's like, what's too much indigenous content in an English class? I mean, how, how, would, how do you address that? It, it is a, it is a, a I mean, it, it, I think many indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, I suppose, I think if you teach this content, um, there, actually I know that to be true. I have a colleague who's been teaching indigenous led in English and, and f feeling a, a, a pushback. And it's a little bit of a sense of, if, uh, you know, students sign up for fiction, an introduction to fiction, they don't expect that all those books are written by indigenous authors or that they have to understand any content. It doesn't matter if every single assignment is dedicated to close reading and learning literary strategies. The fact that it's indigenous authors you know, it, um, sometimes causes students to have a, a, um, a, a sense that it isn't real. And I think we, um, that's something we're all fighting with. What is important to study, what's important to know about, and what's important to learn. Okay, um, I have a question about why you chose the word recuperating. There's so many other words that could be used, mm -hmm. and yet you chose recuperating. Oh, I have a lot of <laughs> a lot of ideas that I was so carefully choosing that specific word. I, uh, I mean, I think to be honest, it it's just a sense that it's it's not discovering because they you know they existed before. Um, it, 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 and also I didn't want, you know, in the same way we try not to talk about being pioneers, I didn't think being discoverers was a good idea either. <laughs> you know, I thought that a sense of trying to, trying to bring something back to people's attention was what I was thinking about, yeah. Because I thought it had an interesting tie-in when you think of Vera Manuel, Manuel and her work in art as well as therapy, and you get this, you get a sense of, of renewal, I guess, maybe, or, you know. No, I think, I think there's, 
what is really, really amazing, and I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. I really wanted to set up so you'd understand how amazing these stories are that we found. Yeah. And, and um, Trini would know because she, she's read them. Is even though they were written in 1987, it is as though, I mean, she's so totally understood uh, um, the effects of um, residential schools and the need for uh, um, people to be able to tell their stories and to, and to heal. In fact, she really flies the convention. Diane Millian in her book, Felt Theory, argues that really 1988 is the year when people started to be able to talk about residential schools, to be able to find a cache of stories that, that are so far ahead of its time is remarkable. But, but she was remarkably located with a very w a culturally trained mother and a, you know, and a father who is a, a, a recognized leader in his own right. Yeah. I'd like to get a question in too. <laughs> um, so, so first of all, thank you for your presentation because I really enjoyed it and I, I know some of the work that we're doing so it was, it was really nice to hear that. Um, but so what I was thinking about a lot and I'm thinking about it in terms of my own work primarily is that we constantly hear Indigenous people are an oral people. And so, you know, when you come across things that are suddenly, you know, they're written down and have been written down for a hundred years, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, this challenge then of how can we consider this, and I hate to use the word, authentic. Um, and so I, I guess I'm wondering is how do we as scholars, researchers, particularly those of us who are still, you know, in the growing stages of that, how do we incorporate these works? Um, into the work that we're doing and acknowledge them, um, given that there's this sense that Indigenous communities are oral. Well, I mean, I think, and I, I understand, um, especially if you understand the oral traditions of uh, West Coast peoples, particularly the Longhouse tradition, you know, that, I mean, well, I have to think of Moha, the Haudenosaunee as well. Okay, so there are lots of oral traditions that are very strong and not particularly well known. I mean, I think you might um, think about indigenous perspectives or the traditions or a rurality, but how many of you could uh, um, compare Stalo versus Haudenosaunee versus Cree um, understanding of the rurality, right? It's all just one big box. Oh, those oral people, right? <laughs> and, and I'm just saying, of course, it is very important, um, but it's in some ways an extension of literacy or literacy is an extension. They're really the same thing. And when, uh, often at a, a time when a student is saying, you know, we're an oral people, it's often, I, I hear it as an expression of, you know, I know there's more than what you're teaching me in this classroom. And I think the complexities of the oral and the literary divide, um, ha, you know, uh, have been debated for, oh, 40 years. I think Brotherton came out with a book in the 70s about, you know, and how important it was not to separate the, you know, the oral and the literate, but it's something people can't hear for reasons that are way more complex um, than, um, than simply having to restate this, you know? And I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody else wants to. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thank you to our, our panel. And I would now like to open this up to the floor. We have approximately time for about three questions and then the food. Food comes. Over here, yes, please. Thank you, Diana. Um, I've been a student since I came to Canada. I, I'm, sorry. Thank you. I have a history where I was born in Africa, my parents were born in India, and my birth certificate says I'm a British Indian. And I grew up at the colonial school with cowboys and Indians. So thank you, I came to a British Indian learning from American Indian. Thank you for your choice, for your knowledge and experience. My question is, in terms of non-indigenous people, I mean, I, I, I've, I've done about nine courses in SFU on First Nations. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how one can share this knowledge of literature, because I do it by telling people to read books about First Nations. Mm -hmm. Although, so that's a power I have in terms of an educator and so on. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, uh, because uh, uh, if, if more and more non-Indigenous and Indigenous people learn about this literature, they can also create a numeracy to, to make the colonizers listen to us. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, imagine a Canada Reads that's had all Indigenous writers. In fact, we tried it in 2014 at a conference. We had Turtle Island Reads. But I mean, I think, re you know, it was said in the late 80s, you know, buy books by us, not about us, right? And I think that's 
still holds true. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Um, you mentioned in your talk that the Ahenikyu family is now hesitant to publish his works because they're, I guess, afraid of kind of relinquishing control over the materials. And I'm just wondering how you, and this is a kind of a difficult question, but I'm curious to hear what you think, um, mm -hmm. how you negotiate sort of um, kind of the scholarly pursuit, which is, you know, to share these really important stories and to also kind of um, you know, pay attention to and acknowledge the community's wishes and the mm -hmm. family's wishes. So mm -hmm. that sort of um, mm -hmm. difficult kind of tug of war between, you know, being a scholar and wanting to share these stories, but also to respect the wishes of the community. I think it's interesting. It's like that. It, I, it, I've really learned a lot through this experience. I really believe that I just needed to be an Indigenous scholar and have a, it happened that the two um, RAs who transcribed painfully from the handwritten into the, the type version and, and checked it, one was Inupiat, the other, uh, the other Yurok and uh, Navajo, so a whole Indigenous team. And wouldn't the families discovering that we have, you know, found this text and contacted them and wanted to work with them, one particular person holds the copyright for this, for his work right now, that, that uh, this person would be wildly thrilled and happy. But actually, it's, you're not, can't simply erase the damage done by a bunch of like good-hearted intentions, right? And so I think that I feel it's completely within the, the um, respect for the material to talk about it, to read portions of it. Um, it's not, um, and at some point, um, I suppose if a scholar wanted to look at it, I, I would share it if they knew, you know, they, the, I mean, they could go themselves to the archives, I suppose, and get the original versions. It's the, the, the novel is available for public reading. It's just that it's not transcribed. And trust me, it's really tough to read in the handwritten version. Um, but th that we were trying to really just encourage um, the family that this is, um, that, that, that we will take their lead on this. And I think that's what we're trying to do is just follow um, a sense of respect um, and, and, and their emotional reactions uh, um, as meanwhile trying to also um, give Haneke his due. Yeah. Final question, yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is also about Edward Ahenike. Uh How old was he when he wrote that novel? And what were his motivations for it? And, you know, and do you think that he puts, inserts himself into a fictional piece in order to vent his uh, you know, frustrations against the world that was well, going? It, it's interesting. <laughs> there, there are actually two w w times um, that could be applied. So old Kayam which in 1973 was published with uh, another uh, text, the Thunderbirds, uh, Thunder Child Stories, to something called Voices of the Plains Cree. Old Kayam is the semi-autobiographical character. He, he goes around, he's like this new generation um, guy who's educated in the white ways, but is uh, you know, a bit of a curmudgeon old man going around and, and, and telling people. And this, I mean, I, uh, the fact that it couldn't get published is spe is <laughs> spe it speaks for itself. Uh, I mean, he had really tried, but also his bishop had censored him. So, I mean, as, an, as a working Anglican minister, his bishop didn't want him involved in political matters. And so, Old Cam was a device for that. Black Hawk, however, is a romantic hero. So, he was born circa the late 1880s. I'm sorry I don't have the dates on me, but he, he passed away in 1960s. And um, Voice of the Plains Creek came out in 73. So, he had this long career as, a, as an Ang Anglican minister and as a Cree intellectual. You know, he really knew everybody. You know, very, uh, the Hemingway family is a very large family. And Black Hawk is the story uh, of the hero. He writes beautifully. He stumbles upon a bunch of people um, who are, uh, you know, who are at a dance, but their, their violin player hasn't showed up, and he, jump, he jumps in and grabs the violin and plays, thus winning the heart of the young white girl. 
And, but of course, he's also very cautious about his dedication to his people. And so the, 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 the pull of um, you know, knowing that uh, he wouldn't be acceptable for, to her family. So it's an amazing story that I don't suspect is based on his own life, but, but actually reveals the tensions, I think, as he's trying to create Cree heroes who are powerful and strong and admirable and honorable uh, and really, I mean, I sus suspect to uh, go against the um, very limited expectations uh, of his people and himself of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can I get uh, Yannick to kind of elaborate on one more thing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more thing. Can we allow one more thing? Yes. Uh, actually, it's about like, academic success. Yeah. And can you kind of like think of how you it would envision that in terms of like indigenous scholars and students who want to study? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Academic success. I mean, I think um, I just read something earlier this morning by somebody. Uh, uh, let me see if I can reframe it. You know, we well, success will be when we're in classes and where is a mix and indigenous students are not a rarity. Um, success is when I indigenous texts that are part of Canadian literature you know, are taught without, be, without simply being the highlights, the spotlight of oh, Eden Robinson, God bless her, we all love her. But I mean, how many times can Monkey Beach be taught, right? You know, as the, as the limited, the sole text that students read, that there isn't a sense that, um, um, that there hasn't been anything worth reading no, um, I think that'll be, that, that will be a moment of real success. And I, I, um, I think that as we uncover more and more work, um, that that is completely possible. I'll give you just one more example. Um, uh, Trina Chambers and Rachel Taylor went to Germany to uh, um, scan the archives of retired um, scholar Hartmut Lutz. And uh, they've uncovered an unpublished manuscript by Alatu Capelli, right? How many more of these uh, manuscripts are sitting, waiting to be uh, not just put out into the world, but actually uh, um, revealed in a way that their family can appreciate, that benefits the community, and that helps expand the canon. Great note on which we reluctantly have to draw this to a conclusion. But I would like to thank you for coming. Thank you to our wonderful panel, and particularly our speaker, Deanna Reader. And I'd like to invite you to have some pizza and carry on with the discussion. Certainly, I think you had your agenda set for a summer reading and <laughs> continuance in the classroom. And uh, we envy your students in your course this summer. Thank you very much.